Meltzer, visiting philosopher, and Phi Beta Kappa, visiting scholar, Tyler Burge. I first read Burge's famous paper, Individual Individualism and the Mental, as an undergraduate in the mid-1990s. At the time, I remember simply being intrigued by the counterfactual scenarios he and his contemporary, Hilary Putnam, set up, and the way those counterfactual worlds opened up new possibilities in how we understand what minds are. Where do my beliefs, meanings, and attitudes reside, if not in my head? When I reread the paper in graduate school, it was instead in the context of the philosophy of language, and it was as if new ways of seeing these fields overlap were opening to me. It was many years later, as I began exploring the contemporary field of extended mind theories, that I once again revisited this paper and realized what seeds had been sown for some of the work that I now do in this paper that I read 20 years ago. I can only hope that all of the students here who have been introduced to Burge's work this semester will have a similarly enriching experience with it over many years of future consideration. Following in our tradition of inviting philosophers with incredible impact in their respective fields and the entire landscape of philosophy, Professor Burge's accomplishments are enormous. He's currently Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at UCLA, having been awarded his PhD from Princeton in 1971. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the British Academy, a member of the Institut International de Philosophie. He was elected to the American Philosophical Society and served as the president of the American Philosophical Association, Pacific Division. He's given the Locke Lectures at Oxford, the Dewey Lectures at Columbia, and the Nakad Lectures at Paris. He's published important books and papers in the fields of the history of, the, of philosophy, the philosophy of mind and psychology, and the philosophy of language and logic, many of which have been collected in several volumes, the most recent of which was published just last year, titled Cognition Through Understanding, which many of us have been reading through together this semester. His work is routinely included in classes on the philosophy of mind, the philosophy of language, and logic. He's had an impact on the way philosophers think about other minds, our own minds, language, and even our justifications for the things we believe. His scholarship on both Kant and Frege has greatly enriched our understanding of two of the great thinkers in the history of philosophy. We're extremely lucky to host Professor Burge now as the field of cognitive studies continues to rise in global importance across disciplines. His talk this evening, entitled Perception, Where Mind Begins, promises to offer philosophical insights to what it means to be the sorts of creatures we are with the kinds of minds we have. Please join me in welcoming our 2014 Phi Beta Kappa visiting scholar and Seltzer visiting philosopher, Tyler Burge. Where does the mind begin? This seems like a natural question. Rocks and fires floating in empty space are overwhelmingly the dominant large citizens of the universe. Most of us are confident that rocks and fires do not have minds. We humans have minds. Do any other terrestrial beings have minds? If so, which ones? There's a philosophical question about how each of us knows that others have minds. That is not my question. I refuse to worry here about whether other people have minds, at least not in this talk. I will not try to answer skeptics about mind in general or about how knowledge of minds is possible. I'm more interested here in what we know than in skept skeptical questions about whether we know or how we know. I do have some sympathy with skepticism about whether some particular humans, certain politicians, for example, have minds. But I will not be dealing even with these skeptical questions. I will assume that we do have some knowledge that will help answer our question, and my job is to explain that knowledge. So our question is, do other types of terrestrial animals have minds? If so, which ones? Most of us think that apes and dolphins have minds, and cats and dogs. The cats seem willful. The dogs seem to want to be with us. Both have eyes that seem to express mindfulness. 
and we hear all the time about how smart apes and dolphins are. Willfulness, wanting, expressiveness, smarts, all seem to be signs of mind. What about birds with their bird brains? What about fish with their lifeless eyes? What of snakes with their robotic, mindless seeming reflexes? What of spiders, ants, bees? The bees lack the endearing eyes that cats and dogs have. Like snakes, the bees and the spiders seem to act in pre-programmed ways. Their repertory of behavior is limited. But the ants and the bees do seem to cooperate in making and doing stuff. Spiders know how to spin webs and know how to get away when we threaten them. Surely knowledge is something that occurs in minds. Bees communicate with one another. Doesn't communication involve some mental state? So maybe bees and ants do have minds. What of worms? What of jellyfish? What of amoeba, paramecia, bacteria? They move around purposively and seem to find places where they thrive. They seem to know how to navigate. Purpose and knowing seem to be states of mind. Well, what are plants? Aren't we going overboard? But wait, plants grow in ways that are pur purposive and beneficial to them. And recently a biologist claimed in Scientific American that trees see. Surely seeing requires a mind. Are we being parochial and pre prejudicial to exclude plants from having minds? Why shouldn't purposeful growth count as a kind of planning and realization of self-interest? Why shouldn't knowledge and perception be ascribed to plants? But then there's a regularity and order in all of nature. Maybe that order is mindful or mind-like. Maybe the rocks like to move in the ways they do. Maybe the fires enjoy dancing. Do rocks and fires have minds after all? Somewhere in this line of questioning, it is easy to feel that things have gotten out of hand. Some of the questions seem silly, but it's also easy to feel that many of the questions aren't easy. People disagree about how to answer some of them. Even where there is agreement, it is not easy to say why we agree. Are the right answers just a matter of cultural habit or choice? Are they relative to what one feels for or cares about? Are they just a matter of what stance one decides to take up toward other beings in the universe? I think not. I think there are definite answers based on scientific knowledge to our questions. In answering the questions, one is likely, if one is honest, to feel uneasy. What is one asking exactly? What is mind? Is one so, so sure of what one means? Is it it's so evident what mind is? Philosophy takes up large, interesting sounding questions that on reflection need to be clarified before they can be well answered. The larger the question, the more need for clarification. Commonly, philosophy must worry about the meaning of the questions it asks at the same time that it take, uh, tries to develop answers to those very questions. That seems like a paradox to some. How can one answer a question that one does not understand? In fact, a lot of our thinking involves terms or concepts that we do not understand very well. Many of us talk about semiconductors, electric fields, radio waves, lymphomas. We understand these terms well enough to use them, but most of us cannot explain them in any depth. So the first thing to remember here is that it is not so uncommon to ask questions that we don't understand very well. Part of finding the answer is improving our understanding of the terms in our questions. Questions about mind are like that. But don't we need definitions to ask a serious question about what individuals have minds? People often ask philosophers, what is your definition of this or that? Here the question might be, what is your definition of mind? Philosophers rarely give definitions. They're not shirking their duty. Definitions are not what, are, what their 
commonly cracked up to be. In fact, we know from some very good work in philosophy by Quine and Putnam that useful definitions are not secure starting places. They can incorporate bad theories. Even when they are invoked in science, they are often open to questioning and improvement. In fact, nearly always open to questioning and improvement. To be useful, definitions must capture something that we already understand. To be accurate, they must ac accord with facts. They do not come for free. In fact, they belong, if anywhere, more toward the end of inquiry than at the beginning. So how are we to attack our problem? I'm going to start with some very general remarks about mind. Mind is not a well-entrenched scientific term. Ordinary speech allows quite a range of applications. My initial discussion brings out how unsteady ordinary talk is when it comes to deciding whether certain animals have minds. We say that worms know things, that safety is downward into the earth, and want things to be left alone. But we also see worms as mindless organisms driven by their biological programs. The tradition of reflecting on mind in philosophy can, I think, help. The tradition is focused on two large features, each of which has been taken to be a mark of mind. Some philosophers have taken all minds to involve both features. Others have favored one over the other. The two large features are consciousness and representation. Consciousness needs little introduction, I hope. It is what it is like to be awake. Notice no definition. There are unconscious aspects of mind. In fact, most of what goes on in our minds is unconscious. But the unconscious parts serve the conscious parts. And an individual that is not capable of being conscious counts for some philosophers as lacking a mind. So for many philosophers, being capable of consciousness is a mark of having a mind. I will not be saying much about consciousness, though I will return to it at the end. I won't say much because although a lot of philosophy and some science have gone into studying consciousness, consciousness is not very well understood. We do not know where in the evolutionary process consciousness begins. We can be confident that we are conscious, that apes, monkeys, dolphins, whales, dogs, and cats are conscious. We can be confident because we know that consciousness depends in some way on the brain. For example, sensory centers like pain centers. And we know that these animals have brains that are similar enough to ours to infer that they are conscious, they feel pain. We do not know whether insects or worms are conscious. In fact, we do not yet know how to study the matter scientifically. The other large feature of mind is representation. I'm going to focus on representation. The term representation is used in many different ways. I want to clarify a use that centers on a distinctively psychological or mental kind. Representational psychological states are those, and here comes some jargon, so um, I'll try to explain it, but stick with me here. Representational psychological states are those that have veridicality conditions as an aspect of their natures. Let me provide some commentary on the ideas in this point. First, veridicality, or ver veridicality conditions. Veridicality is being right about a subject matter. Veridicality, as I use the term, has two main species, accuracy and truth. I use the term truth for veridicality of propositions. Propositions, or propositional representational contents, are simply things that can be true or false and that have the same structure as complete sentences or complete thoughts. I use the term accurate for veridicality that is not propositional. 
symbols that are accurate or inaccurate are drawings and maps. Perceptions are also examples, I think, of psychological states that do not have propositional structure and hence are accurate or inaccurate, but not true or false. A veridicality condition is a condition for being right about a subject matter. A representational content, as I use the term, is such a condition. If the condition is fulfilled, the representational content, whether it be propositional or perceptual or non-propositional, uh, if the condition is fulfilled, the content is veridical. If the condition is not fulfilled, the content is not veridical. A propositional representational content is true or false. For example, a belief that dolphins are friendly to humans has a truth condition. A propositional representational content that is fulfilled if dolphins are in fact friendly to humans and not fulfilled otherwise. Since representational contents are kinds of psychological states, the associated kind of psychological state, in this case the belief, is true or false as well. Similarly, a non-propositional representational content sets a condition for being accurate about a subject matter. If the condition is met, the content and the associated perception are accurate, and if the condition is not met, they're not. Representational contents or perceptions are kinds of perceptions. A perception of something as spherical is accurate if that something is spherical, otherwise the perception is not accurate. So much for the exposition of the notion of veridicality condition. The rest of my explication of the term representation holds that to be representational, a state must have veridicality conditions as an aspect of its nature. Nearly any state can be treated instrumentally as if it had veridicality conditions, or as if it were a psychological state. Doing so enables us to treat states as psychological or mental. We do, we do not think that they really are. We can say that a planet wants to get around the sun in the usual way, and its want is fulfilled, that is made true, if it does so. Bacteria can be treated as more or less accurately representing light or oxygen and knowing light or oxygen to be harmful and wanting to get away from them. Treating bacterial states as if they had veridicality conditions can be useful, but treating them that way does not make it so. In the psychologies of some individuals, having veridicality conditions is an aspect of the natures of the states, that is, an aspect of the kinds of states they are. A scientific understanding of the states themselves invokes veridicality conditions. The laws that the states figure in are specifiable partly in terms of veridicality conditions. Science does not explain planetary orbits or bacterial movement or bacterial sensitivity to light in terms of veridicality conditions. Planets do not have states of desire. Bacteria do not think or perceive. Science does explain the formation of certain psychological states, most impressively perceptual states, in terms of veridicality conditions. Certain animals, in addition to humans, have veridicality conditions, representational states, as real aspects of their psychologies. As, as noted, it is often convenient, though metaphorical, to invoke veridicality conditions in a description of a phenomenon. Some have taken having veridicality conditions as simply a status accorded those states for the purposes of someone who describes the states. So Dennett um, held such a view. Um, he recently told me he never held it, but it's right there in print, so I think. Uh, such a view is skeptical that veridicality conditions or representation in the strong sense that I've laid out are real psychological kinds. Such a view holds that representationality is in general a matter of our stance toward a state, not a real feature 
of the state. This instrumentalist position is incompatible with the usual realist view of science. Science invokes representation as a kind embedded in law-like patterns. The most developed science of this sort is perceptual psychology. Other parts of psychology appeal to states with veridicality conditions as well. So there's empirical scientific reason to take representation in our strong sense as a real kind in the world. Another way of avoiding appeal to the notion of representation that I've been outlining is to substitute for it certain other notions commonly expressed with the word representation that are also present in scientific explanations. I'm going to call this family of notions information registration, even though in science they're often expressed with the same word representation that the notion that I'm using um, uh, is expressed with. The core of this family, family of notions, which um, I'm calling information registration, is the technical notion of Shannon information. In this sense of information, one state X gives information about another state Y if X is statistically correlated with Y to some relevant degree. Thus, if workers getting off from work in China is correlated with a cock's crowing in Nova Scotia, then each gives information about the other. And it can be said quite literally on the relevant usage that one type of event represents the other. Clearly, this notion of information as statistical correlation is not the same notion as the notion of representation I'm explicating. The latter notion is distinctively associated with psychology. The former is an all-purpose notion of regular statistical correlation. I'm going to skip a little bit, but uh, sometimes this um, uh, statistical correlation notion is supplemented with a causal notion. So something is said to represent, X is said to represent Y if X statistically correlates with Y and is causally dependent on Y. I'm not going to go through cases that make it obvious that that, um, that usage is also very different from the use of um, representation I'm uh, using. Um, let me skip to a third uh, member of the family. Sometimes information, th the information theoretic notion I started with, together with a causal notion, is adjoined to a notion of biological function. The result is often termed representation. Thus, for state X to represent Y in this sense, X must not only correlate with Y and be causally dependent on Y, X must also have the function of correlating with Y. This conjunction of notions is still vastly more inclusive than the notion of representation that I began with. A plant's growing in a certain direction correlates with, is caused by, and functions to correlate with the direction of the sun. But the plant's states do not represent the direction of the sun in any psychologically distinctive sense. No appeal to veridicality conditions figures systematically in accounts of the processes of the plant. That's the key idea. I'm going to make it over and over again. One can hold the correlation causal functional complex, rep can call it, representation if one wants, and many scientists do. But one is not using a psychologically distinctive notion of representation. No science explains the plant's growth in terms of having states with veridicality conditions as aspects of their natures. Um, they are purely biological processes. Many of the sensitivities of plants and other organisms have been illuminatingly explained in terms of information registration. The very uh, family of notions I've just been discussing, there's nothing scientifically wrong with the family. Many biologists and philosophers use the term representation very broadly to comprise all information registration. Doing so curries interest, it's sexier and gets more headlines to grant and grant money to say that the bacterium represents oxygen and knows how to get away from it, or that the sea, a tree sees the sun. But nothing genuinely about veridicality conditions enters into the account. 
no representation in a psychologically distinctive sense enters into the account. Even explanations in the science that use some notion of information registration do not use the notion in explaining the formation or processing of states. The notion enters only into background functional explanation on account of what the biological structures are for in the survival of the organism. The basic states and processes of the plant are explained purely in biochemical terms or structural terms that are not in any ordinary sense psychological. No science takes the plant's internal states to have accuracy or truth conditions with distinctive structures and semantics. Accuracy does not feature in the biology of plant processes. Of course, one can talk that way, but I think this is not literal scientific talk. One should not confuse the information a sense of registration with the psychological sense of the same word. The extreme breadth of application of the information registration notions indicates that they differ in significant ways from the notion of representation that has traditionally been thought to be involved in perception, belief, language, and reasoning. There is a scientific difference between information registration and representation in the sense that I'm using the term. In what I'm going to call genuine representation, veridicality conditions play a role in actual scientific explanation, including actual scientific explanation of causal processing. They play such a role most impressively in perceptual psychology. The point of perceptual psychology is to explain causally how individuals perceive particulars and attributes in the physical environment and under what conditions individuals fall into perceptual illusions. This form of explanation has been present in psychology since Helmholtz's work in the late 19th century, but it has become the centerpiece of mathematically rigorous systematic work that has become a mature science since the early 1970s. The science of visual perception has become a more impressive science than many parts of biology, including many parts of neuroscience. Since science is perhaps the best basis for judging what sorts of things there are in the world, there is powerful reason to believe that representation involving veridicality conditions as a key feature is a basic psychological kind. Representationally successful perception is perception that is accurate about a subject matter. Perceptual illusion is a mistake about a subject matter. States that are capable of being accurate or inaccurate about a subject matter are postulated in perceptual psychology, both as things to be explained and as factors in causal explanations of other perceptual states. Representation in the sense that I've outlined lies at the center of a mature, rigorous science. Of course, it's an empirical question whether one kind of scientific explanation can be reduced to another, but reductions must be earned. Philosophers often assume that uh, scientific explanations in psychological terms are going to be reduced in uh, into scientific explanations in other terms, but this assumption actually must be um, made good. It can't be just carried around as if it's obvious. It's not acceptable simply to assume such a reduction. I believe that there are systematic reasons why reduction of representation to any of the types of information registration that figure in science is unlikely. I'll not go into the, main, uh, to the idea in detail here, but I want to sketch the main idea. The nearest thing to the notions of accuracy and error in the suite of ideas that comprise various types of information registration are notions of fulfillment or failure to fulfill biological function. Success in realizing a biological function is a practical matter, fitness for survival. But truth, accuracy, falsity, and inaccuracy are not practical matters. In principle, biological success could be correlated with inaccuracy all the way down. Biological failure could be correlated with accuracy all the way down. It's not that way, but it could in principle. It's conceptually possible. Error can contribute to fitness. 
a rabbit's repeated misperceptions of danger combined with, combined with quick trigger reactions might not only ensure against capture, its expenditure of energy in acting on those misperceptions could make it more adept at fleeing. Similarly, accurate representation can contribute to failure of fitness. Accepting truths about how things really are can lead to dysfunctional depression. The practical value of contribution to fitness is simply not the same as the representational value of riticality. So a purported reduction, in my view, in effect changes the subject. In summary, I think it unlikely that representation can be, in my sense, can be scientifically reduced to any type of information registration. There's no question that representation that sets for riticality conditions and information registration are different theoretical notions. I believe that they have irreducibly different explanatory potentials. Explanation of accuracy and inaccuracy and of formation of perceptual states capable of accuracy or inaccuracy explain different matters than explanations of contribution to fitness. Perceptual psychology postulates representation as its central kind in its primary scientific explanations. In philosophizing about a science, the most reasonable starting point, I think, is to accept the commitments of the science itself. I've been making some references to the science of perceptual psychology. Its postulation of representational states indicates that states with veridicality conditions are explanation grounding kinds or natures. There appears to be no more primitive representational psychological state than perception. Perception is where representational mind begins. I will be trying to develop commitments of perceptual psychology as a point of uh, departure for understanding that beginning. The first basic point about perception already made is that it is a psychological state with veridicality conditions as part of its nature. A second basic point about perception depends on knowing something more about perceptual psychology. I'm going to say just a little about the shape of the science. The central problem of perceptual psychology, paradigmatically and most thoroughly studied visual psychology, is to explain causally how veridical perception and perceptual illusions are formed from sensory input. The science presupposes explanations in physics that connect environmental events with impacts on the sensory receptors. For example, visual psychology assumes the account in optics of how light is propagated from a surface of a certain size, shape, reflectance, and in a certain position to impacts on the sensory receptors. The optical laws of light as it projects from a surface to a certain array of frequencies as they strike the retinal receptors are well understood. This is old and very stable science. The psychological account has two main forms. One explains a causal chain of states that begins with the registration of inputs into the visual system, for example, the first effect of light on the retina, and ends with perceptual states that represent the environment as being certain ways. The second form of the account explains how environmental entities reflect light into the retina so as to yield perceptual states. The second form combines the first form, which starts on the surface and moves in, uh, with, the, uh, with the optics. The second form enables the psychological science to explain accurate perception illusion. Since the perceptual states are about aspects of the environment, the, the science must reach all the way out to the, uh, to the elements in the environment that are seen if it's going to account for accurate or inaccurate perception, uh, both in general and in particular cases. Explanation of this sort can both anticipate general environmental conditions under which perception will be accurate or inaccurate and explain successful perception and illusion in particular cases, and this can be done with some considerable mathematical rigor. What makes both forms of explanation difficult and interesting 
is what is known in the science as the underdetermination problem. Visual perception represents particulars and attributes or properties in the environment. But the initial states of the perceptual system are sensory registrations of proximal stimulation. Proximal stimulation is the stimulation closest to the sensory receptors. Such registrations of light arrays impacting the retina are not perceptions. But these and other registrations are all that the visual system has to go on. Different environmental conditions can produce the same registrations of proximal stimulations. So in this sense, proximal stimulations do not determine their environmental causal antecedents, the entities that are perceptually represented. Correspondingly, the registrations of proximal stimulation underdetermine perceptual states that are accurate or inaccurate with respect to the environmental causal antecedents. That is, a given registration of proximal stimulation is in itself compatible with many possible perceptual states. So there are two types of underdetermination that confront the central explanations of perceptual psychology. One is underdetermination of the environmental objects of perception by registration of proximal stimulation. The other is underdetermination of perceptual states by the registration of proximal stimulation. The underdetermination problem is that of answering the following question. How are perceptual states that represent specific particulars and attributes in the environment produced given that the proximal stimulation to which the system has immediate causal access do not determine either the environmental entities that the perceptual states represent as being there or the perceptual states that do the representing? The initial registration or encoding of proximal stimulation, which is mainly the registration of light, goes through a series of transformations in the visual system that eventuate in perceptual representations that represent entities in three-dimensional space. There is a determinate optical and geometrical solution to the problem of determining how a three-dimensional array projects onto a two-dimensional coding of that array but there is no determinate mathematical solution to how the two-dimensional coding is transformed into a representation of a three-dimensional scene. The retinal coatings, together with all further input from proximal stimulation, underdetermine even the physically possible environmental causes. Perceptual states sometimes, however, accurately specify environmental properties and refer to environmental individuals or particulars that have those properties. So perceptual psychology must discover laws that govern how reg registrations of prox proximal stimulation cause visual perceptions through a series of transformations. These formation laws are distinctively psychological. They systematically cite representational states in terms of accuracy conditions of the states. For example, a perceptual state that specifies surface or body X is farther away by such and such a distance from surface or body Y. The formation laws or law-like patterns of processing in effect privilege or bias towards certain possible environmental causes uh, and privilege those causes over others. The effect of the privileging is that the underdetermining uh, under registration of the proximal stimulation triggers through a series of transformations a perceptual state that represents exactly one of the many possible environmental causes that are optically compatible with the incoming light and its registration. The underdetermination of environmental causes by proximal registrations renders the formation of per perceptual states subject to error. Illusions occur when abnormal, or what I'm calling unprivileged, environmental causes produce the same types of registration of proximal stimulation that are produced by normal privileged distal causes. These conditions, the conditions under which illusions occur, are a topic of the science. The foregoing discussion of the underdetermination problem grounds my second point about perception. The point is this. Formation of perceptual states constitutes a certain type of objectification. Given that a process yields a perceptual state that specifies 
or has accuracy conditions regarding environmental entities, formation of perceptual states involves a type of objectification. This objectification is a formation of a state that functions to represent a subject matter beyond the idiosyncratic features of the individual. The subject matter is the physical environment. The objectification involves a certain removal from the local or idiosyncratic. Objectification resides in the ways perceptual systems overcome the two forms of underdetermination. Perceptual system distinguishes patterns coded in sensory registration that are likely to be adventitious or idiosyncratic to the perceiver or likely to be abnormal um, from patterns that tend to cor correlate with specific aspects of the environment. When perceptual processing yields a representation of the physical environment, it constitutes the relevant objectification. The sensory registration is local and idiosyncratic. The perceptual states represent a reality beyond proximal stimulation. Objectification is is in perception is implemented by what are called perceptual constancies. This is my last semi-technical term. Uh, it's a term from the science. Perceptual constancies are perceptual capacities systematically to represent some given particular or attribute as that very particular or attribute under significant variations in registration of proximal stimulation. In a perceptual constancy, a perceptual system can represent some given aspect of the physical environment as that aspect from different perceptual perspectives produced by different proximal stimulations. Uh, for example, this, most of you have seen this sort of thing, but uh, shape constancy is a capacity to perceive a given shape under various stimulus and perspectival conditions. You probably all know that you can perceive a, uh, a shape like this is rectangular, whether you're looking at it more or less straight on or whether you're looking at it at an angle. Um, and this does not depend on background knowledge. Of course, you know that it was the same piece of paper and pieces of paper don't change shape and all that. You have a cognitive realization of the constancy, but the representation of the constant shape is not at all dependent on that background knowledge. Uh, it's, automatic adjustments that are made within the, in the perceptual system. So the example is meant to bring out that um, although the proximal stimulation you got in those two cases is dramatically different, uh, your perceptual system is capable of, of representing the, a, constant, um, a constant shape from the very different perceptual perspectives. There are many other type of constancies. I'll mention uh, another um, color constancy is the capacity to represent a given color as the same under various stimulus conditions, especially under different illumination. So you can see a given surface as a shade of red, whether blue light is shining on that surface or white light is shining on that surface. And the result of the blue light shining on the surface produces radically different proximal stimulation coming into the eyes from the result of shining white light on the surface. But the visual system can, um, can specify the surface as a certain shade of red under both conditions. Uh, it, won't, uh, it won't be uh, fooled by the, the difference in the illumination. The visual system is focused primarily on the, on the surface surface color, not on the illumination, though it actually does keep track of, of both. Okay, there are many other types of perceptual constancies. I've just given uh, a couple of examples. Perceptual constancies are marks of objectification. I conjecture that a sensory system is perceptual if and only if the, the system includes perceptual constancies. The idea of the conjecture is that the central aspect of perceptual systems that makes it necessary to explain formation of their states in terms of representational contents with veridicality conditions is the presence of perspectival capacities inherent in perceptual constancies. My conjecture is that in the absence of perceptual constancies, a system's ability to connect sensorily with the environment can be adequately explained in terms that do not invoke representational contents with veridicality conditions. 
As a matter of scientific fact, explanations of many sensory capacities do not need to and do not invoke representational contents that set accuracy conditions. So the bacterium sens sensitivity to light is, a, is an example. Maybe in the discussion period I'll give some other examples. Such explanations do not ascribe perceptual constancies. I believe that this difference in explanatory strategy between those that attribute veridicality conditions and those that don't corresponds to a difference in sensory capacities between those that involve perceptual constancies and those that don't. Representational accuracy and perceptual constancy are, I think, natural psychological kinds acknowledged in science. As I've intimated, many species exhibit perceptual constancies. Some arthropods, bees, locusts, and some spiders, most reptiles, amphibians, and fish, and probably all birds and mammals have visual perception. Most of the spatial constancies occur in these visual systems. Color constancy is scattered through the animal kingdom apparently depending on how central color is to the life of the species. Birds and bees tend to have it. Many mammals appear to lack it. We're fortunate. Object constancy has been demonstrated in many birds and mammals. Various aspects of touch, proprioception, and hearing are perceptual, involve perceptual constancies, again in a wide variety of animals. Since certain arthropods have perception, and since perception involves the most primitive type of representation, these animals have the most primitive type of representational mind. Representational mind begins with bees, spiders, locusts, and pray, praying mantises. So let me summarize my overall argument. Perception is a natural psychological kind recognized in rigorous, mature science. Perception is marked by having accuracy conditions as a part of the nature of the kind. The formation of perception involves a type of objectification. This objectification is a process that systematically contrasts phenomena that encode proximal stimulation at various levels of abstraction and phenomena that systematically represent specific environmental conditions. Objectification is marked by processes embedded in exercises of perceptual constancies. These are perceptual capacities to represent some environmental particular or attribute as that particular attribute under a large variety of proximal stimulations and from a large variety of corresponding perspectives. The simplest animals that are known to exhibit perceptual constancies are bees, certain spiders, and other arthropods. So they have perceptual capacities. Perceptual capacities constitute the most primitive sort of representational mind. So representational mind begins in the arthropods. I return to the other mark of mind, consciousness. In our current state of knowledge, I see no point in wrangling over priority between consciousness and representation. I think it better to follow out each of these marks of mind to see where it leads. We may come to think that our concept of mind straddles importantly different kinds, representation and consciousness, or we may come to understand some deep sort of unity between the two primary marks. If someone wants to reserve the term mind purely for systems capable of consciousness, I'm not going to object. I prefer to talk about representational mind or representational aspects of mind or conscious mind, or if you insist, representational psychology. I think that understanding the main marks of mind or psychology is at this stage the main matter. In any case, it is not a scientific requirement on perception that it be conscious. We know that bees and spiders have perception. We do not know whether they are conscious. Moreover, there is empirical reason to believe that some perception in bees and even in us is unconscious talk about this later, but a simple example for human beings at least uh, is blind sight, where it appears that the people with blind sight really are unconscious of what 
is out there in front of them, but they, are capable, they show perceptual constancies. If they're forced to guess as to what's happening uh, in front of them, they guess is a way, way above chance. Um, further, not all consciousness involves perception or even representation. Awareness of the felt quality of pain, as distinguished from proprioceptive locating of pain, does not require does not seem to require representational content or perceptual constancies. There may be organisms that feel pain and hence are conscious, but lack any representational capacities. And there may be organisms, perhaps the bees, that have representational capacities but are never conscious. We do not know where consciousness begins. For example, we do not know whether awareness of pain, where awareness of pain begins in the animal world. We do not know enough about consciousness even to know how to investigate the matter systematically. So we do not know where conscious mind begins, but we do know where representational mind begins. It begins with the arthropods. This result may not make us feel any special kinship with the insects. They do not make good pets. They do not love or appreciate us. They lack endearing eyes. But we do have this in common. We're both capable of representing aspects of the physical environment in a distinctively psychological sense of represent. We both have representational mind. In this respect, we're part of a small minority in this universe dominated by rock and fire. And we differ importantly from another minority with which we share life, the plants and other pre-psychological organisms. Thanks. We are now entering the question section. If anyone has any questions for our speaker, please ask, and I will raise your hand, and I will come to you so you may ask a question on the microphone. Hi, I listened to you speak earlier this afternoon and I have a question about the approach you're taking. About because which? The approach that you're taking is yeah. uh, for perception is a very traditional approach. There's another theoret theoretical camp to perception that does not believe that the receptors is the starting point for perception. Yes. Uh, those, of course, are the Gibsonians or the ecological yes. psychologists. Um, how do you deal with that other theoretical camp? that's very much um, different from the one that you've yes. selected? Um, uh, frankly, I think it's going to be left behind. Uh, it's already a minority view in the, in the science. Um, and what's, I think, providing the basis for my confidence is that very rigorous laws are for, for the representation of particular environmental, representation of particular environmental properties have been formulated and confirmed uh, on the basis of retinal uh, stimulation alone. So it's to say that quite a lot of visual representation doesn't depend on movement, uh, uh, doesn't depend on uh, other aspects of um, perception, which are definitely there, that the Gibsonians claim are essential. Um, the successful laws have been stated that uh, go from uh, retinal stimulation alone. Uh, this is not to say that um, uh, proprioception and movement don't play any role in perception. They clearly do. So that aspect of the Gibsonian program is, is right. And some types of visual perception do make use of movement by the body and all the rest. But the, the general ideology that drives the traditional Gibsonian view, I think is simply not holding up because, because of the power of laws that have been stated by the more Marian tradition. Uh, moreover, I've, as I look at the actual proposals that 
uh, come out of the broadly Gibsonian camp, they're not remotely as rigorous and powerful. I mean, it's the same sort of general ideology that's proposed by Gibson. I don't see tremendous progress from Gibson's uh, own views out there. So I, I think that, of course, I'm making a bet on uh, how science is developing, but the bet's based on watching the progress of science over the last 40 years. Uh, the split from Gibson occurred in the 1970s, and many of his former students, like uh, Roger Shepard, for example, uh, have repudiated the general ideology. Not to say that there are not important contributions coming out of Gibson and the Gibsonians, uh, but the general uh, insistence that, um, uh, say, retinal stimulation is a special case, you can't get very much out of it, um, and that we have to embed the, the perception in, in a whole movement system, simply is not holding up. So I'm not sure exactly how much of the program you're, uh, you're pushing on me, but um, the, the parts that I've described, I think, are... You know, they're making contributions and all that, but the general program, I think, is just not going to work. We'll have to talk more later, because <laughs> my idea of Gibsonian psychology is very different from yours, yes, and okay. it does not rely on movement. Yeah, um, all right. And they well, do talk a lot about vision, Yes. and they are being as new as they are, only from the 1960s. Yes. Traditional psychology came about in the 1700s, so yes. they have a ways to go to catch up, as it were. But we can, we'll talk tomorrow, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, I mean, different people mean different things by Gibsonians. My last stop, I had a, I dealt with a very uh, committed Gibsonian, and movement was the key to the, to, to the idea. But if you want to um, you know, try out another line, I'd be glad to discuss it. Uh, I was intrigued by what you said about um, how percep false perception can be advantageous. You gave the example of the rabbit. Um, I was wondering if there were, you had more examples of that uh, happening in humans. Um, the thing is, that the, the example is meant to bring out the in principle difference between these two ideas, fitness for survival and accuracy. Um, in fact, the two do run very closely together, so you have to think rather hard to get examples. Um, uh, so my point is not that they don't co-vary. They do mostly co-vary. They don't co-vary in every case, but they mostly co-vary. What I wanted to bring out is more, uh, look, fitness is, one, fitness is a practical matter and accuracy isn't. That's the key idea. Uh, of course, there are pragmatists who think, no, truth is really a practical matter. I, I think that's a, a bankrupt view about truth, uh, but there, it's a tradition in American philosophy to hold that kind of view. So I, I can't pr provide you with you know, tons of examples of this sort, but the point of the example wasn't to suggest that it was prevalent. In fact, it's remarkable how close uh, perception uh, serves our practical interests and those of the animals as well. Do we have any more questions? Don't pretend this is wrapped up. You can surely generate some more. Yeah, there we go, Hedda. Hey, um, I was just wondering if you ascribe to a particular theory of consciousness, because it your theory touches on consciousness a lot, yeah. so I wonder what your thoughts were on right. how consciousness I reject consciousness a resists. lot of views. <laughs> uh, um, I guess my views are fairly close to and kind of almost a refinement of Ned Block's views. So I think consciousness is not, uh, not, representa not essentially representational in, uh, in, the, in the sense of representational I'm using. Um, I, I think consciousness, unlike representation, depends pretty directly on the, on the brain. I don't think it is the brain, but 
uh, I think, uh, degree of consciousness, type, what kind of consciousness is involved, I say degree of pain, what kind of pain it is, and all that depends on the underlying neural things in the way that representation doesn't. Representation depends much more on interrelations to a wider environment. So I think of consciousness as being kind of individualistic. It really depends on, on the body, whereas representation depends on a quite complex uh, ecology for having the meaning it, it has. So I reject um, uh, functionalist views of, uh, of, of, of consciousness, for example. Also, also think the, uh, the idea that consciousness is a kind of meta representation is a mistake. Um, I don't think there's any representation at all, much less matter representation. So self-consciousness or meta-consciousness is one thing, and consciousness is a, is a, quite, uh, is a quite different thing. I, I suppose the guiding idea for me is that uh, representation is a very broadly functional notion. It has to do with what you can do, uh, what your system can carry out. I don't think consciousness is a functional notions, so there are reams and reams of papers uh, written to show, I can show what consciousness is if I just construct a certain kind of computer program. I think that's totally on the wrong track. I think consciousness is not that kind of uh, phenomenon. Um, I, I can't say very much about what kind of phenomenon it is, uh, but I, the, what it, the what, it, what its likeness of consciousness, I think, d does depend on some, some underlying uh, structure. I don't think there's going to be any hope of uh, producing consciousness in a robot made of silicon. No matter what the robot does, uh, I don't believe you're going to convince me that it's, that it's conscious, though it might see, it might uh, represent things. Um, so those are some commitments I have, but I, I think of them as uh, responses to what I think of as relatively wild-eyed and confused philosophical approaches, uh, it's not much of a positive theory. I'm mo much more ambitious in my attempts to understand representation. I, I feel a little hopeless about kind of, my view is it's probably 60, 80, 100, 150 years off before we get uh, any deep understanding of the notion of consciousness or the phenomenon of consciousness. With regard with, with regards to um, your, I suppose it would be the skepticism regarding the ability to create a uh, conscious or or um, robot. Is that is that due to the our lack of understanding of consciousness among other things? What would your why are you skeptical about it then in that case? Okay, uh, it, the main idea is that I I believe that consciousness depends on the kind of material that's underlying. It has something to do with the organic electrical nature of our uh, and other animals' brains. So if you try to replicate consciousness by doing a certain program on a computer or a robot, uh, I think you're, conf you're, you're making a fundamental mistake about what consciousness is. It's not a how to do things kind of thing. <laughs> it's, it's a way things are. So. Uh, that's just to repeat the point that consciousness, I think, is not a functional uh, phenomenon at all. It's a, it's a what it's like phenomenon. Uh, so I'm betting that uh, what it's like to be conscious and actual feeling of pain depends in some way on the particular kind of organic material that we're made of and that occur in our brains. Uh, and I, I don't think you can produce something that's functionally like a brain but made of silicon, say, that's uh, gonna be conscious. I can't prove that, and there, there are smart people that uh, simply disagree with that, but I haven't heard anything to, from those smart people that makes me think otherwise. So it's not a, high, it's not a hopelessness about understanding consciousness. Um, there are people, uh, Tom Nagel, for example, who, who think there's something essentially mysterious about consciousness, that, 
that there's something about it that human minds can never fully understand, so there'll never be a science of consciousness. I, I don't believe that. I think science has a way of worming its way into every important subject and making some of it, but, but it takes a long time. The, um, visual psychology is an example. People have been talking about visual psychology since Aristotle, uh, but it didn't form up into a, a real science until I, I mean, until impressive science until about 40 years ago. Uh, so I'm, I'm not particularly pessimistic about ultimately understanding consciousness, but I think the understanding is going to come in some sort of account of the relationship between the way the brain works and, and consciousness, not by programming computers and looking at a certain kind of complex uh, program. Do we have any more questions for our speaker? Um, with the uh, obvious exception of Aristotle, many philosophers have not really wanted to attribute minds to non-human animals, um, and you seem pretty comfortable doing so, um, even all the way down to insects. And uh, I think one of the reasons why is because uh, they associate mindedness with um, moral personhood or moral status. And, uh, and maybe by treating representation rather than consciousness, um, you're, you're avoiding that a little bit. But uh, yeah. I, I wonder what, what you would say about yeah. um, whether your view of, of uh, what it takes to have a mind should change the way that we think about moral status. Yeah, uh, okay, that's a good question. Uh, let me preface an answer here. Um, I somewhat fudged a tradition in the history of philosophy here. I talk about psychology and mind pretty much interchangeably. Uh, but in fact, some philosophers make a pretty strong distinction between the two. Descartes's an example. Descartes thought of mind as going with consciousness and representation as going with psychology. So. Um, uh, so I'm pretty comfortable with somebody thinking, well, you've got a, you know, I'm not going to call those insects' capacities minds. Uh, they may not even be conscious. I say, all right, you're, I'll give you that. I'm interested in, in the kind here. There's definitely representation there. And psychology is, in a traditional sense, which concerns states that are right or wrong, uh, accurate and inaccurate, is certainly applying to them. So that takes some of the sting out of uh, being so liberal about insects having minds. I don't insist they have minds if you mean, if you want to confine the mind, the notion of mind to consciousness. But still, a little farther up the, even if the insects aren't conscious, you go a little farther up. I think once you've got any kind of consciousness, you've got a notion of mind on, in, on nearly anybody's account. Now, of course, Descartes thought that only humans uh, were conscious. Uh, this is a notorious view. It's uh, hardly anybody else accepted it. Um, so uh, Leibniz and Kant both believe that um, many animals have essentially perceptual capacities, but no other ones. And they thought they were conscious, and we needed to use uh, different concepts than, uh, in explaining them than we do in explaining the planets, say. OK, now back to the moral. The moral issue. Um, I'm, I think morality really does uh, center on um, entities with consciousness. Uh, um, I do think entities that have consciousness and a certain kind of um, self representation are especially deserving of moral consideration. But I think any animal that can feel pain has got some claim on us, maybe overriding. If we can override it for other considerations, I think uh, nothing like the claim on us that a person has. But if we know we're, uh, we have an animal there, then one claim is don't cause, even if you need to kill it, to eat it don't cause unnecessary pain to that. I think that's just wrong. 
uh, to torture an animal uh, that can feel pain. So that, that's, a, that's a sort of first commitment. And I don't think it, if the uh, insects, even if they perceive things, as they do, but suppose they're not conscious, I don't see anything wrong at all in stomping on one. You're not hurting it. Um, they don't have life plans, so you're not up, you know, upsetting their plans or anything like that. So that's part of it. But I do think as representation gets uh, complex, it has moral significance. So I think knowing the difference between right and wrong, which is a kind of meta-representation uh, about the nature of one's own actions and intentions, that's, that's, a, that's a basic condition on being subject to moral evaluation, moral responsibility. So I think both marks of mind do figure in, the, in, our, um, in our application of moral principles. Uh, Consciousness alone, but I think a, an individual that, could rep, that can represent but can't feel anything, I'm very doubtful it has any moral status at all. So if you have a very complex robot, you convince me that the robot sees things and maybe even the robot thinks and moves around. Uh, I don't, I mean, I think it, this is a very valuable thing out there, but uh, I don't think it's morally valuable. So I would think, I mean, my view is, suppose you have a dolphin here, I talked about this earlier today, a dolphin, not another human being, but a dolphin. We know dolphins feel pain. And we have this complex robot that thinks much better than the dolphin, much more useful and all that, pretty much mimics anything a human being can do functionally, but doesn't feel anything. I, I wouldn't have blink if, if I were forced to drive an ax through one of these two beings, I wouldn't blink. I'd go, I'd, I'd destroy the robot in a moment and not destroy the, the dolphin, because I know it, uh, this would cause the dolphin pain, and I think the robot would feel no pain whatever. I mean, we'd lose something valuable, but it would be a kind of instrument that is like destroying a great piano or something, which may have a kind of moral uh, badness to it, but it, it's not at all the same. Uh, first, I'll just say I'm, I'm, I'm relieved, you know, mosquitoes aren't long, uh, long for coming here, and so I'm glad to hear I can still squash them. Yeah. Um, but my, my, my question, it's, it's sort of a fuzziness about something that maybe is straightforwardly answered in the science that I just am ignorant about. Um, but in the connection between mind and representation and the representation and perceptual consistency, I guess I have sort of a... Constancy. Constancy, yeah. excuse me. That I, I, have a, I have sort of a, a just a, a fuzziness about how much we can know about something's perceptual constancy, right? I mean, I sort of understand how I perceive the world uh, through my senses and the way they work, uh, and I feel much more at a distance from how, I don't know, a bat or a bee perceives the world. And I suppose if I'm, if not to be, you know, sort of too biased here, I, I'm at a distance from how a plant perceives the world. Uh, and I guess what I'm wondering is how we have confidence, for example, that a, that a bee, right, perceives, has sort of perceptual constancy in a way that something that is maybe more radically unlike us does it. I mean, could, could our lack of attribution of perceptual constancy really just be a, a misunderstanding of that thing because it's so at a distance from how we perceptually interact with the world? Well, distance seem, they do seem phenomenologically distant. We don't know what it's like from the inside uh, for a bee, uh, but the vision science doesn't make all that much use of what it's like from the inside, even in studying human beings. Uh, uh, so there are, there are rigorous behavioral tests that are done on bees to determine whether they, say, have a color constancy. They need to get to the yellow flower uh, you shine um, strong blue light on the yellow flower uh, and see whether the bee will track uh, the yellowness. Um, then that's part of the test for whether they have constancy. So they go for yellow flowers and white light, they go for yellow flowers and blue light, they go for yellow flowers and uh, red light and all the rest. Then they, you try to construct an account of how they are doing it 
and uh, there are detailed accounts that can be partly tested um, in, by reference to what, how they're made. I mean, what their eyes are like and what the neural tract is like. So there are a number of sort of external scientific ways of testing whether these animals can do this. Uh, nothing like uh, color constancy or light or luminance constancy shows up with plants. I mean, you can explain what the, how the plant grows purely in terms of the, in, of the type of intensity of light and where on the plant it's shining. That's enough to do it. Uh, so you can do it entirely in terms of the proximal stimulation going onto the plant. You can't do that. You can't explain the, the bee's behavior entirely in terms of the nature of the proximal stimulation. Um, there, there, there are other cases. So let me take another case. It's a little different, but um, uh, salmon um, solved this immensely complicated problem of finding their home stream. They, they're born in a stream. Uh, they stay there about two years, then they shed their skin, they molt, and ha that's a signal for them swimming out, out of the stream, out into the ocean. They then spend four to five years out in the ocean, sometimes as much as a thousand miles away from the home stream. Uh, at a certain point in their life, something clicks again and they turn around and swim back, and a very large percentage of them manage to find the home stream. Some of them get lost, but dramatically, many of them, after swimming around ra seemingly randomly in the ocean for four to five years, they manage to navigate back to the home stream. Question, how do they do it? For many years, nobody knew. Um, uh, about 30, 30 or 45 years ago, it became plausible, and, and now it's increasingly, it's well established that they do it through an analog of smell, olfaction. Uh, when they swim out through the stream, they lay down a series of smell types. Um, and when they come back, they simply reverse the series. Um, and the amazing thing, no, the reason nobody expected this is that nobody realized that there were blocks of smell, there were smells that are specific to the home stream, and there are blocks of smell in the ocean uh, that uh, remain stable over years, that that the salmon can make use of to come back. Now, how do they, what kind of sensory system do they use? The whole system can be explained in terms of the strength of the smell on one side or the other side of the body. If the smell is stronger on this side than on this side, then the salmon turns toward the stronger side, and it keeps going in that direction until it weakens. Then it, it, it goes into a sampling sort of way of swimming, it zigzags, and the zigzags are quite wide when it's sampling. When it, when it doesn't have the next smell, it'll, it'll zigzag. But when it picks up the next smell, then it will orient in the same way. If, if, they're stronger, if the smell is stronger on the right, it'll turn to the right and zigzag much more smallly, and, and much, much more dramatically. So um, the whole sensory exercise uh, can be explained in terms of retention of a series of smells and surface stimulations of the smell. No perceptual constancies involved at all. So this is a non-perceptual a non system. It's a sensory, sensory system that solves an immensely complicated problem. So sometimes sensory systems are amazingly virtuosic in what they enable an animal to do. Uh, and the, and the salmon, in fact, does have perceptual constancies, but they're not used in this uh, grand navigation. They use visual constancies in the, in the home stream to find the bottom in various ways. Uh, so how do they, they were able to test the salmon's capacities and, and predict whether you could explain what the salmon was doing purely in terms of, this, of the, uh, of the uh, proximal stimulation, you can. So I'm just trying to illustrate how science can use uh, external tests, so to speak, to determine what the, what the internal capacities are of these animals. We can't talk to them. I mean, we have an advantage with humans. We can talk to them. But.
Do we have any last questions? Okay. Closing remarks? No. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>